Hello, everybody, and welcome to Elephants in Our Room. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I am your host, Janet Carolesson, and I have my co-host, Deborah DeFranco, here with me. And today we have a very special guest, Steve Behrman, also known as Swami Beyondananda. <laughs> I'm sure you've seen him on YouTube and other places. He's an internationally known author, humorist, and workshop leader for over 33 years. He's written and performed as Swami Beyond the Nanda, the cosmic comic. And his comedy has been described both as comedy disguised as wisdom and wisdom disguised as comedy. And Marianne Williamson has called him the Mark Twain of our generation. So I'm not going to read all this stuff about Steve, Swami Beyond the Nanda. I have a website called, um, what is it called? SurianRadio.com. And on there, I have a page just for Steve and so all this information. I've got some YouTube, to books, and I want you to check that out sometime here on AquarianRadio.com. So before I bring on Steve, I want to make sure Deborah joined us on the show. Welcome. Aloha, Deborah. How are you today? I'm in Maui, Hawaii. That's why I say aloha. <laughs> and, and Deborah's in uh, upstate New York. How are you doing today, dear? Aloha, everybody. Just, you know, yeah. happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. <laughs> okay. So, Steve, um, let's have you come on and tell us about yourself and your work and your comedy, and um, let's lighten up this day. I've had a heavy day. I hate <laughs> Bill. Let's lighten it up <laughs> first, or the first part of the month. Go ahead. Take it away, Steve. Okay, well, thank you so much for having me on your show. I remember you from many, many years ago, uh, maybe when we were in Hawaii or maybe it was in L.A. And, um, <clears throat> I mean, there's a lot to say. Um, my, my background originally is in political science, although I have to admit that I never got quite so far in that that I actually got to dissect a politician. I never quite got to that point. But um, I've had a career. <laughs> I've had a career. Yeah, we don't, we know what they're like, you know. Oh, there's no guts. Oh my God, there's no heart. Ah. Anyway, but but anyway, um, but for the last uh, 33 and the third years, I just celebrated my 33 and the third anniversary doing comedy as a Swami, and so now I'm officially long playing. Uh, I've been uh, traveling the world and uh, uh, writing and performing comedy, uh, being in the material world. There's plenty of material. Uh, given our current political, the new word is shit, situation. We have a situation. There's a lot to uh, laugh about, and there's a lot to um, many, many good reasons to use humor to brighten our hearts, to give us courage, to give us insight uh, as we go through this very um, challenging passage that, uh, that we're going through right now. So um, whatever it is, uh, Comedy will help because it heals the heart, it frees the mind, it uh, gets us away from our dueling dualities and creates, uh, takes us out of the head, puts us in our hearts, and reminds us of the uh, enduring power of love, joy, and laughter. Uh, and particularly when we're in uh, situations that are challenging to us, uh, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, when you have this perspective of being able to laugh at it, it gives you uh, it gives you leverage. I'll, I'll tell you one quick story, and then I, I'll turn it back over to you. Um, in okay. his book, Man's Search, book Man's Search for Meaning, um, Viktor Frankl writes about being at a Nazi death camp during World War II. Uh, a, one of the most dire uh, conditions you could ever imagine. And while he was there, he and a fellow inmate made a pact that every day they would find something to laugh about. Because if you're able to laugh when all else has been taken away from you, there is still that spiritual reserve that can't be captured. There's a certain dimension of freedom that you retain if you're able to laugh at your situation voluntarily. And to give you an idea of how powerful humor was in this situation, one of the jokes that actually circulated among the inmates in the camps involved these two Jewish guys who decide that they are going to assassinate Hitler. 
They know Hitler's motorcade is going to pass a certain intersection at 11 in the morning, and they're waiting for him. They show up 11 in the morning, he's not there. 11.15, 11.30, when he's not there, by 11.45, one of the assassins turns to the other and says, gee, I hope nothing's happened to him. <laughs> yeah, that's cute, that's cute. Yeah, That's the power we really of perspective. Well, a lot of people think we're in hell right now, so we need to find. That's how we stay free: is if we can laugh even at the most dire situations. So you know, it's, how did the, the it's, yeah? Go ahead. I just had one 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 thing to add to that. You know, there was a book uh, where I read I read about that uh, story in a book called Laughter in Hell: Humor and the Holocaust. And it talked about the uses of humor during those very dark times. So um, as Winston Churchill said, if you find yourself in hell, keep going. There's something at the, there's something at the other end of that. And so um, we are in a very hellish situation. Although Swami, my, my character Swami, doesn't believe in hell. He believes in heck. Um, <laughs> heck is a state where things are just mildly irritating, persistently mildly irritating, like like crappy coffee or being stuck in traffic or sitting next to somebody who has horrific perfume uh, on a long, long intercontinental flight. So um, one of the ways that we deal with this um, hellish situation is that we create a degree of separation from whatever it is that's bothering us by cultivating the perspective of humor. Right. So what do you do when you're, yeah, what the heck, yeah. Well, they have a, I have a coffee mug now, and it's got a bird on it, and the bird has, you know, WTF with a question mark, you know, it's like a really stupid-looking bird. So um, humanity is full of cartoons and, and how, you know, how to make fun of things. Look at all the political cartoons. And they seem to, when you have a political cartoon, you can get away with it. So what do what we what do you poop out like COVID and the upcoming presidential elections? Let's just go a little roundtable here. What do you think of all that? <laughs> well, you know, I'm going to bring it. Can I bring the Swami in? I can bring the Swami in. He can tell you bring about the his Swami state. In. Yes, that'd be Hold great. on. Yeah, he's, he's he's floating above. Let me let me get him. Hold on. Come on, Swami. Come okay. on down there. You you want you want it here on Earth. Whoa, hello everybody. Oh, hello, how are you? I can I can see you because I have that uh I have that transcontinental vision. Uh and you know, these are very, very challenging times that we're in right now. And of course with the COVID crisis, um if you've been locked down with loved ones for five months and your loved ones are still liked ones, then you're doing just great. Yes? Well, I took, you know, I, I people are, are, were talking about um, social distancing, and I decided I would take them up on it, that I would go to distance. So I have used this whole time to practice social distancing. I finally took that trip across the galaxy to the center of the Milky Way. Um, that's what I call social distancing. And you'll never guess yes. what I found at the center of the Milky Way. Chewy nougat. Yes. There's chewy nougat at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, or is that three musketeers? I keep forgetting. Uh, I, well, I, I hear the snick. I hear the snickers. I hear the snickers. And, and so it's when close. I came back, I, I found that a lot of people are feeling very upset, very fearful. And so the, the key to getting through all of this is attitude. Attitude. Your attitude makes all the difference. You either have, you know, and people who are feeling very upset about being locked down. Well, of course, locked down, that is a downer. So I say let's view the situation differently. I'm not locked down. I'm locked up. You see? Doesn't that feel much better? Hmm? I'm locked up. Yeah. And so, and, uh, and so a lot, there's been a lot of controversy about wearing masks. Everything is very funny these days because, you know, these days, it's the outlaws who aren't wearing masks. Isn't it funny? Um, and, of course, uh, 
and of course, I myself, uh, I am wearing, when I go outside or I, when I'm around people, I put, you know, people say, well, you should put on a mask in solidarity with all of those people who are, um, um, have conditions that make them susceptible to COVID. Well, I am slightly different. I put on a mask in solidarity. I cover my face in solidarity with Muslim women everywhere. That's my, that's my take. That's my take. Um, as for yeah. our political situation, um, well, let's say it is it is definitely a situation because um, we have a deeply divided body politic in this country. Half the people believe the system is broken, and the other half believe that it is fixed. Uh, <laughs> and so all of the, yeah, I, because I think, frankly, we need to impeach the entire impeachable system. And um, again, we have people on all sides of the political spectrum who are wondering, you know, how did we end up having to vote for the lesser of two evils? Uh, because even at the last election, what's I traveled all around the country. <laughs> well, well the, what's with that? It, it's essentially, uh, it's the oldest political game in the world that's called divide and conquer. Divide and conquer. Yes. And so if you get people divided into these two tribes who spend all of their time arguing about whether it is worse to kill the born or the unborn, then you allow the commonwealth to be stolen by a very, very, very small percentage of the uncommonly wealthy and the bill and consequences being sent to the not yet born. That's really where we're at. So we need to bring right left on. and right, front and center to face the music and dance together. Hmm? That's what we I need agree. to do to turn yeah. the, to I turn love the function. The that one we put. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay, yeah, well, I'm yeah. sorry, I let you talk. What did you say? I'll let you talk, I won't talk over you. Go ahead, Deborah. Oh, okay, good, good, yeah, okay, good. You done? Okay, oh. <laughs> so back to you, Swami. <laughs> okay, very good. Well, well, I will say that this is the way that we turn the function to a function and leave the junk at the junction. We need to bring red tribe Republicans, blue tribe Democrats together in sacred circle to sit and talk until they're purple in the face. Because only by well, being that's together... The problem. At- why? Well, yes, but they're all, not, they're only not by talking being together. Anymore. They're yelling and, and beating each other up, and now they're shooting at each other. You know, we we did a right. show on called Active Measures, which is what you called you described very accurately, Swami. What's called Active Measures, the divide and conquer strategy. <laughs> and so right. our whole country is divided right now. Like I've never, I mean, I'm 66. I've never seen it like this. So yes, it was. It, it, you forget well, it how is. bad it, it got in the sixties. They were shooting yeah. students. They were shooting students on college campuses, and that's one of the few memories I have as a child. So let's not forget the difference between the younger generation and the older generation back then. Again, it was a fight between conservatives and liberals. Well, I think that it's even more sophisticated than that now. I, I think I'm going to turn it back over to Steve because I think he can explain it better than I can. I'm stuck in the, in the okay, domain Bobby. of talking and quips. Hold on. I'll bring him back. Okay. You know, speak. Uh, yeah, thank you, Swami. Th- speaking of jokes, you know, one of, the, one of the ones that came to me the other day is that, you know, we have Black Lives Matter we have Blue Lives Matter, and it's working. Our country is now black and blue. And, and I, think that, I think that part of what's happening, you know, there, there's a word apocalypse. And the word apocalypse means the lifting of the veils. It means that the curtains are being lifted on all of the toxic perpetrations and secrets and everything that have been going on for such a long time. And... Um, uh, another saying, the Bible didn't quite say it this way, but the truth shall upset you free. And as people on all sides are learning different parts of the truth, um, 
you know, we have um, totalitarian tendencies on both sides. We, of course, have the uh, very autocratic and dangerous, uh, you know, Donald Trump. Um, and uh, what you see is what you get. He really is uh, operating like a mafioso wannabe who um, will spring his friends out of jail, will obscure the rule of law, and will um, will run over uh, anything and anyone in his way. And uh, he's selling a fear-based narrative. But then on the other side, the COVID is another fear-based narrative. And there's just as much totalitarianism on the progressive side in uh, in perpetuating the lockdown and the masks, which um, haven't necessarily um, made the difference. Uh, but what they have done is they've, they've shut down our, our businesses. They've um, basically damaged the middle class, completely ruined the middle class in many, many places, and are getting people used to, like every crisis, every time there's a crisis, as with... Um, uh, 9-11, they used that to enact the so-called Patriot Act. Um, they used that to um, create surveillance against the American people. And it seems like if we're looking at this from the higher view, from the meta view, beyond the two political parties, it certainly seems as if this crisis is being used as a way of controlling the population. So, uh, Great. so like what is real then? What to is see real? What's real then? Because, you know, there have been plagues since the dawn of time, and the strategy of wearing masks and social distancing has been applied in previous plagues. Uh, you know, we have people saying this is science and this is science fiction. So how does the average person determine, and that's part of the divided conquer, mask, no mask, a vaccine work work and vaccine is going to you know turn you into a board. There's all this information and disinformation, but how does anybody determine what's true? And it all controls the population because it's all trying to tell us what to do and what we should do and when and here and how and why. So, what do you well, think? That's Steve? really the, that's really the that's really the big problem. The big problem is that there are truths and lies on both sides. And when people polarize the way that they've been polarized, um, and yet people don't really want to be that polarized, there's truth and lies on both sides. And um, when people are polarized, they buy an entire package, some of which is true and some of which is not. So if you want to, um, if you want to dismiss somebody's point of view that might have some truth to it, you make sure that there's plenty of disinformation in there so that the people look at the disinformation and say, ah, well, everything that, that, that they're saying has to be not true because of this piece of disinformation that's been planted there. Um, the word, the term conspiracy theory was popularized uh, in the late 1960s by the CIA to discourage people who were um, poking around um, uh, uh, the Kennedy assassination and finding uh, reasons to disbelieve the Warren report. And so if you're able to call something a conspiracy theory, then uh, people, well, it's just a conspiracy theory, it's just those paranoid people. Now, there are conspiracy theories that are totally crazy out there, but many of them have a grain of truth. And then when you take, um, when you take that, that truth and you expand it to have enough lies, then you're able to dismiss any truth, any kernel of truth that exists. Let me give you, here, here's an example. Uh, a really good example is this QAnon movement. Um, some right. of your listeners might, might be familiar with that. And, and the whole theory behind it is that there, is, there are these, um, and again, it's very anti-progressive. It, 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 you know, the progressives are engaging in, um, the elites are engaging in pedophilia, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And right. um, Donald Trump is secretly a good guy, uh, which, again, it stretches belief. And, um, <laughs> uh, 
I, I, I mean, yeah. I don't, I'm a very proud Democrat, and I don't like Donald Trump, and I, I speak it up, and I say it, and I, I hope that they... I, I can't even I believe you said Mars. Trump. I can't even believe you said Trump and good in the sense like you were able to keep like from dying laughing. Well, so you so you take something like that, and then of course the punchline of the of QAnon is that uh, John Kennedy Jr. didn't really die in the plane crash, and he's alive oh, and waiting to be resurrected oh, when his buddy Donald Trump brings him brings him forth, and these people. Believe in that. Now oh, the kernel geez. of truth. How did, he, how did he not die in the plane crash? Where, where's he been? Is he with Elvis? I'm not. I'm not <laughs> defending that theory. No, you know, he's but, with um, Ken Lay, George Bush's friend from Enron. They're on an island somewhere together. Yeah, well, probably you're on separate islands. I, I do believe Ken Lay <laughs> probably uh, is getting laid somewhere uh, and not laid to rest either. Um, but I, th- I think that. So what happens is, what happened with that um, is that there's a kernel of truth to it. Here's a kernel of truth. Um, I've spoken to people who've been involved in uh, clandestine operations, who've been involved with our American government, and I've had a number of people say that um, pedophilia and uh, things like um, um, the island that Jeffrey Epstein would take people to, one of the purposes of that is blackmail. So let's imagine that you've just been elected to public office, you get invited to something like the Bohemian Grove, or you get invited to fly with Jeffrey Epstein to his island. You get there, you're feeling very like, oh my God, I'm somebody. I'm somebody. I'm on this big plane. They've taken I'm me to the plane. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Yeah, I'm on the plane. On a, it's not a higher plane; it's a lower plane, and uh, and and so you're with you're with underage children, and photos get taken, and these photos are in reserve to make sure that if you stray from um, the the line that uh, that the people who really run things um, are want to want to perpetuate, then you'll be stopped. You got to wonder why right. is it. All of the public will um, to end the corruption in this country. Why doesn't the corruption end? And what I believe is it's only my them. opinion. <laughs> it's only my opinion. But they have something on those people. One of the people that I spoke to a number of years ago, who was involved, he was in the government, and and who told me about these things. He says the reason why Paul Wellstone died in that plane crash was because they didn't have anything to blackmail him with. And so, you know, they figured that was... And that was right before... uh, That was in 2002, uh, right before the vote in 2003 to go to war in Iraq. Um, So you'll remember there was the anthrax scare. There were all of these things. And most people in this country... and and particularly most people who identify as progressives, they don't want to believe that there is such a level of evil uh, in our own government. It's too uncomfortable. It's too um, hurtful. And people don't want to imagine that that kind of thing could could happen. And so consequently, uh, we've had uh, in our country since the end of World War II, We've had what I call a don't ask, don't tell policy. Um, Our government, uh, we promise not to ask our government what it's doing to quote unquote protect us, and they promise not to tell us. So we've had perpetrations like the Kennedy assassination, both Kennedy assassinations, Martin Luther King assassination, um, 9-11, all of these things that um, I can't tell you in any of those cases what what actually happened, but I can say with pretty much certainty that what didn't happen was the official story. Let me let me break that down, Steve. This this is all good what you just said. Good stuff. Okay. So these are all what we would call conspiracy because uh, I don't I don't see it so much as don't ask don't tell. It's like 
Uh, we're going to shame you. If you believe that, then you're just a conspiracy theory person. So it, it, yeah. at first it was like that they could use, oh, that's a conspiracy to shame you. Now you see how it's kind of Orwellian style, now QAnon, and that conspiracy has been turned around. Now that's a good thing because they're going to let the, that lady from the blonde lady, or what is it, the dark haired lady from the South, and she's a QAnon person. So now conspiracy is a good thing. So they always reverse double speak everything and twist it around. And then, oh, did you know that they ha- that the to become pope you have to kill babies, you have to eat them too. Yeah. So there's all these things out there, right? <laughs> and this has been going around for years. So people who are in the know, I wrote this down. They're 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 proud of themselves. I know what it is. I'm in the secret know. I have conspiracy, spirituality, spirituality. Yeah, like it's, it's like a new religion. That my new religion is conspiracy stuff, and I'm conspiritual, and I'm conspir- and I have some spirituality. So, so that's a problem there because that mixes up people. There's so much babble, nobody knows what's real anymore. And so I used to follow conspiracy. I used to think I was in the know. I've been into ufology since, you know, I was a child back in the 60s, Betty and Barney Hill. So I thought, oh, I'm in the know, and those people don't know what they're talking about. And, you know, each religion thinks I'm in the know, I have Jesus, I'm in the know, I have Buddha, I'm in the know, I have, you know, Muhammad, and the other person doesn't. So it's like this um, polarization of religion. And now we're back to, okay, I'll, I'll bring it back to you. Go ahead. You said, well, go ahead, Steve. Take the talking. The more, the, the more, um, the more fear, the more people want to cling to certainty, and so people will find a certainty that fits their narrative. The QAnon narrative fits uh, fits those people who are suspicious of any. You know, why are they against? Um, um, why are they against vaccines? Because in certain vaccines, um, aborted fetal tissue is used. And then that plays right into the abortion thing. Um, you can mm-hmm. find videos that show, uh, that look at Hollywood movies and take all of these symbols as um, uh, symbols of um, um, Satanism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, Many of these, I've looked into some of these stories, and some of them are quite convincing. And I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, um, a friend of mine who I've known for many years, who's a solid citizen and trustworthy individual, she told me a story. She grew up, she's probably now, maybe she's 60 now. She's about 60 now. And she grew up in in a military family in the United States. And when she was a girl... Um, they would go, the children would be sent to these sessions, and she doesn't remember much about them, but she felt like they were, there was a, some kind of a brainwashing going on. And then when she was mm-hmm. about 12, um, she and her brother, who was close in age to her, were sent down to the basement um, told to pull their pants down and just wait. And a military, American military officer came in um, and he was supposed to have his choice of which one he wanted. And he wanted the boy. And her brother um, was uh, violated and he later committed suicide. Now she's telling me something that her father was involved with. Her father... Um, mm-hmm. who she's been estranged from for a number of years. I've heard stories like this, and my question is, if somebody is speaking from their personal experience and there's a certain level of congruity to it, why, why would they be making up a story like that? Why would someone make right. up a story like that? Um, and at the same time, when you look at some of these videos and you start to examine some of the imagery uh, particularly, uh, there was a big kerfuffle about this Pizzagate thing. And I had a friend 
Great. Um, who is very addicted to the Pizzagate thing. And what, it, it's kind of like um, it's an addiction. You um, mm-hmm. Every day there's new information. And, again, as you said earlier, there's like this secret. Okay, I'm, I'm privy to a secret. There's something that's privileged about me. I know more. Um, and then, of course, if you can project the evil onto those other people, if you can project the evil onto those other people, then you have the self-righteousness. Like the guy that got so caught up in Pizzagate, he took out a gun and tried to shoot up the place. But when you look at the mm-hmm. graphics at that pizza parlor, when you look at the graphics that um, John Podesta has in his home, these are very, very disturbing graphics. They're a lot about children in very sexual um, positions, uh, poses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and in a lot of these rituals, uh, there's faux cannibalism. There's one woman who has these parties where um, there are, you know, the the food that they have is designed to look like people. You know, and you're right. going, okay, I mean, uh, but you're wondering, what kind of fetishes do these people have? And if you're looking at the quote-unquote elites, it should be obvious that the people who have all of these resources have made separate rules for themselves that don't apply to other people. So now you get mm-hmm. the deplorables, the quote-unquote deplorables. You get these people who are in flyover country, who are who are being ridiculed by mainstream media, being ridiculed by Hollywood, um, who are being, uh, you know, made fun of, and they're, they are coming to realize that those rich people out there, and it's not just the, um, you know, not just the oil company executives they're looking at. They're looking at the celebrities that lead uh, absurdly opulent health, uh, lifestyle, and then they go. They right. realize, you know, those people have different morals than I have, and those people are influencing my children and their children. Um, and right. you know, and so if you start to look, if you begin to look at it from their point of view, which I've I've been doing, I after the um, 2016 election. I decided to educate myself. I decided that I'm going to talk to people. I'm going to, you know, go deeper. I'm going to talk to people who are Trump supporters. I have a very good friend who voted for Bernie Sanders in the primaries and voted for Trump in the election. Lost all of his friends, except for me. Uh, He was one Mm -hmm. who was following this piece of gate. Um, He has since said, I've given up all addictions, including that. Uh, but he was following this very closely. And once you start to track the quote-unquote facts, you can almost find facts to back up any contention that you might have. And um, it's been almost 40 years since Walter Cronkite gave his last broadcast and said, and that's how it is. And so since 1981, we haven't had anyone to tell us, and that's how it is. And so these two narratives have gotten very, very entrenched. And if you find yourself caught up in these narratives, um, it's very, very difficult to discern the truth. So on my Wiki Politiki radio show, I've been interviewing people who have alternative views about COVID. I interviewed Mark Crispin Miller, and I'll tell you, like, that's a really very interesting story about how somebody becomes, quote, unquote, a conspiracy theorist, okay? Uh, Mark Crispin so Miller. The, uh, uh, so he said an alternative COVID theory. What's, what's his alternative theory? Well, I mean, he's, uh, well, his theory is that the masks don't work. He's got tons of evidence that the masks don't work, that um, they don't do anything to, um, uh, while in a normal cough or sneeze, um, they, they prevent the particles from leaving, from um, uh, leaving the, uh, you know, going past the mask, uh, particularly the, the, the medical surgical mask, the particles from the 
uh, virus are simply too small. Um, and that Right, so they've are, been researching the mask, and some are not effective at all, like the bandanas. And so that was, at first, they were just scrambling because nobody knew what to use. But we've had masks going back to the plagues, and they used to wear those big, big or bird big backs. And, and those people used to go in and take care of the people that were dying of the plague. And those doctors, you know, in the 16, 17, 18 hundreds, they would survive. So there's something but there's about been, it that where has accurate. There, where but, has been, where, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying is that there's, any evidence that they're not effective uh, is simply dismissed, is deplatformed. I, I know people who have had their here's – an, here's an example, not about the mask, but about something else. Mm-hmm. Um, Andrew Stahl uh, is a world-famous expert on vitamin C. He's been studying vitamin mm-hmm. C since the 1980s. Um, he was one of the doctors um, who developed the protocol for using intravenous vitamin C when they first used it in Wuhan uh, when the, when the uh, COVID broke out. And in fact, they have been using um, um, intravenous vitamin C um, and, uh, and along with, uh, with, some, with zinc and some other things in hospitals in Wuhan, using it in, in New York as well. But his uh, Facebook page was taken down. Um, because he talked about vitamin C. Natural treatments, remedies um, for uh, prevention, um, natural remedies for treating COVID at, their, at, at the initial stages are being deplatformed, debunked, and these people are being put out of business. Now, there is no damage being done by those people. In fact, I know, I know doctors that I've known for decades uh, around the country who have been using natural means to treat COVID outside the hospital, but they cannot publish their findings. They cannot tell anybody about their findings. Otherwise, they will lose their medical license. So I'm thinking that there's, uh, you know, on one side you have people saying, well, there's a lot of people who have died because there hasn't been the social distancing. I'm saying that there's probably many people who have died because they haven't had access to these treatments at early stages. When you get to the point where you're using ventilators, uh, I think the conservative figure is that 90% of those who go on ventilators die. So, Right, so let me, let's there, look at the vitamin C yeah. thing. Um, yeah. this, uh, we have a lot of information to cover here. So. Um, so my brother, or my father-in-law, let go back to the 1980s, uh, never caught anything. And he took huge doses of vitamin C all the time. But the American Medical Association has never wanted us to go into the world of vitamins and supplements because they, they're, they're drug pushers. They're pushing their services. They're pushing, pushing their surgeries. So they never want us to look at alternatives that will be more effective. So we've, all, we've had that going on all our lives. Um, so that's but one aspect of it. It's getting worse, it's so worse to now. They're, they're using the COVID. Um, they're using the COVID to deplatform that from more and more and more. Yes, it's been going right. on. It's a trend. And so they want, they want to be able to use their patented vaccines. And when you go into the right. vaccine story, that's that's even more dark. Uh, again, you know, oh, it's conspiracy theory. Well, if you actually take the time to watch a video with Robert F. Kennedy Jr., if you take a time, the time to watch um, uh, The Truth About Vaccination, if you take a time to watch um, that, The Vaxxed Movie, some real questions come up about why these things are being deplatformed uh, and um, and uh, dismiss this conspiracy theory. When you start to look at that, then you start looking at the fact checkers like Wikipedia, uh, for example, or Snopes, and, and you're coming to see their biases. I'll give you a, another quick example. Did you say you have to take a break? Did you say that? 
No, we don't. What but if I... you want to, we could. Are you are you needing a break? No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I thought. No, we... I thought okay, but let me let no, me continue with no. this online. Okay. Go ahead. Um, you know, everybody is all over. There, there's there was that that uh, documentary that came out, Plandemic, and um, right. everywhere. Yeah, the first thing that you ever see about it when you Google it is debunking it. It's conspiracy theory. It's discredited. Blah 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 blah. So I went and watched it. I actually went and watched it. Trudy, my wife, and I sat and watched it. And um, mm-hmm. one of the one of the things that the fact checkers said was not true. She said that she was um, arrested without a warrant and no charges. And they debunked that they said it was untrue. And then they showed an mm-hmm. actual photo of the um, a- arrest report. There was no cause listed and there was no warrant. So what happens is people who, um, well-meaning people, and these are all my friends, and I'm one of them. I'm, I'm a progressive. I'm certainly part of the progressive tribe. Um they are told that this stuff is conspiracy theory, and they, you know, of course, if, if, it's, if Donald Trump says hydroxychloroquine is an effective treatment, it's got to be wrong. Well, hydroxychloroquine is for some effective. people, it's got to be right. <laughs> yeah, so, it is an effective so treatment. That's part of the that's part of the active measures. They over information overload with every perspective. Everybody out there spouting their stuff, QAnon, not QAnon, you know, Republican, Democrat, all the philosophies, all the information overloads people. When you get information overload, a percentage of them are just going to shut down and do nothing and not know what to do. So that's what happened with the um, operation against Hillary, because Hillary stood up to Putin, and he said, I'm taking her out. So that's what happened. That's why everybody was so shocked in 2016. They're coming down the wire, and it looks like all the, you know, Hillary's going to win, and that's why we're so shocked when we woke up the next day. I was in my, I was at Shelley's house <laughs> watching John as a stock Republican. But anyway, he gets so shut down. He's only, I'm not even going to go vote. I'm, I'm not going to vote for the lesser of two evils, or, or I'm not going to bother because, uh, you know, it's over and she's going to win. No, this whole thing is a conspiracy about the conspiracies within the conspiracies. And, the, and so let, I don't believe any of it anymore. None of it. Let, let, me, so let me go back. Let me go back. Backward. Go ahead. Go let back. Me go back. Let me go backward a little bit um, to uh-huh. look, at the two political, look at the two political parties and how they've developed over the past um, 40 years. Um, in the 1970s, in the Nixon administration, um, um, there was, um, I'm trying to remember his name, uh, the, he became a Supreme Court Justice. Um, I'll remember his name. Um, oh, okay. And, and Nixon administration. Uh, yeah, he was in part of the Nixon administration. Um, and he was... Um, I can't remember his name. I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Um, I'm looking it up and, right now. Okay. Uh, he was, uh, uh, no, 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 no. It was... Earl um, Warren? Was, Warren let's Turner. go back. Um, the something report. Oh, no, no, no. It wasn't... Oh. I hate when this happens. Um, maybe I hate the swamp. that, too. <laughs> anyway. Um, he was hired by the. He was a tobacco company uh, lawyer, which tells you, <laughs> which tells you where he was coming from. Um, right. And yeah. Was, and so he uh, went to the American Chamber of Commerce, and he said, and this is right after um, Earth, the first Earth Day. It was right after Nixon actually signed the. Um, um, uh, Environmental Protection Act and created the EPA and um, he wrote this report essentially warning uh, big business that regulations were, were going to kill them and so um, 
what happened over that next 10 years from, from the Nixon, Nixon era to Ronald Reagan's election as president in 1980 is that there was a very, 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 very well-funded campaign to discredit government. And, you know, the famous Ronald Reagan saying was um, uh, the, the most uh, frightening words you can hear, I'm here, for, I'm, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you. And so the Republican talking um, had to do with the government is bad, the government is bad, the government is bad, the government is bad. Well, the government mm-hmm. is the only thing standing between um, the rule of the oligarchs and we the people. And so right. this particular report that was put out, um, essentially very, very well funded, created this propaganda campaign that elected um, Ronald Reagan in 1980, and it's been part of our political um, our political system since then. Meanwhile, mm-hmm. on the other side, um, in response to that, starting with the Clinton administration, the Democrats have become the other corporate party. So in the Obama administration, as much as people loved Obama, um, They had great hopes for Obama. In the Obama administration, there were more Monsanto people appointed than in any prior administration to regulatory positions. So both administrations, both the Democrats and the Republicans, are corporate parties. And the same interests are behind both of those parties. And so part of the reason why... um, let's say the culture wars have become so hot is because the differences are stoked between the two parties to make sure that we, the people, don't actually have a conversation for possibility amongst ourselves. Right. And the media... But everybody's conflicted uh, in some way. They've got, they've got something on everybody... Because in order to join the the club and become, in order to get elected in, into the higher offices, you have to be yeah. somehow um, uh, compromised. So what? So they used Epstein and they did the sex um, island and they did that for years. They got Clinton. They, they got Trump. They got all of them. I don't know why it doesn't get pulled on Trump right now, but they keep. You know that's why Trump said this because he knows it because he was there, right? <laughs> he was there with, on the plane. He was there at the island. So they all know it. But what did they have on Obama? Because you could tell when he came out of the first meeting, he was wise a ghost and was holding his kids too like they were going to kill him right there on the stage. So they had something on him too, even though he thought he might have had all these ideals going in, that I'm going to change the system. But once you get there, now, um, Snowden says that the big, tall whites come in, the extraterrestrials come in and say, you think that the, the world is run by humans, it's extraterrestrials. So there's another conspiracy. I've heard them all, right? <laughs> but, um, yeah, so go ahead. Back to your, your exposition. That's very well, well, you know, I think there's a, there all, a couple of different ways to look. A couple of different ways mm-hmm. to look at the Obama thing. Um, I think a lot got projected on Obama. I think that... Um, he uh, he really was not as progressive as people hoped he would be. Um, and one of the great insights I got about Obama was from the basketball fan. And the basketball fan, who was a Republican but who voted for Obama, um, he said, Obama does not like to, in his basketball game, when he's playing basketball, he doesn't like being underneath the boards. Um, he doesn't, he'd rather do a three-point shot from outside rather than mixing it up uh, with the rough and tumble. Um, during his administration, I, I heard a talk by um, a guy who wrote a book about uh, Obama and the banking industry, one of his friends. And he said that throughout the entire Obama administration, his staff would give him books about um, Lyndon Johnson would give him books about uh, 
Franklin D. Roosevelt, hoping that that would spark some courage, that that would spark some desire. But there was not, in, in the entire Obama presidency, as articulate as he was, I cannot recall any courageous act, any act of stepping out and being a leader and saying, I'm stepping out and doing this. And I'm calling on my people, all these people who supported me, who voted for me, who followed me, who worked for me. I'm calling on you, like Donald Trump is calling on his people. And Obama had a lot more people to call on than Donald Trump has in his cadre. Obama never used his bully pulpit. And he never stood courageously for anything because of who he represented. He represented the corporate Democrats. He did not represent the Bernie mm-hmm. Sanders group of people. He did not represent those people. And those people have been consistently defeated every time by the Democrats, by the Democratic National Committee. So one of the reasons why, why Trump won, or rather Hillary lost, is because he was so despised by that branch of the Democrats Plus, she didn't campaign in Michigan. She, she didn't engage with real people. And so it was left to Donald Trump. He was the only one who had a vital movement. We were traveling around the country in 2016, and all over the place, there were Bernie, Bernie posters, Bernie posters, Bernie posters, and then there were Trump posters. There were never, I never saw a Hillary poster. One, I saw one. And this is in the fall. This Mm -hmm. is after she has the nomination. So, and now we have the same thing with Joe Biden. Joe Biden's claim to fame is he's not Donald Trump. So she She stood down. Um, She stood down. She let it happen. Well, I think what happened was her. She stood down, is that what you're saying? Yeah, she didn't let it happen. She didn't. She didn't follow through. She let it happen. Something that there's what my insiders and my conspiracy people say is they already know who the president's going to be, and they know who's going to be for the next fifty years. You know, they they can time travel into the future. They know. They told um, at a meeting. They told um, what's his name, um, Bush, yeah, or, um, Bush Jr. They said, you're going to be the president of the United States. And he was going around this dinner party and said, did you hear that? I'm going to be the president of the United States. You know, so apparently, uh, and I have another person, George Green, who, who died a year ago in, in June, and he's an insider. And he said, yeah, I was in the, in the big meeting when we were making, you know, how we're going to do derivatives and how we're going to take down everything. And, um, and they said, well, you're a very smart man. We'd like you to be the economic advisor for the next president. He goes, what do you mean for the next president? Who's the next president? And they said, Jimmy Carter. I said, well, how do you know it's Jimmy Carter? Oh, there's no real elections. We know who's, who's going to be the president. You know, it's already been decided. Well, is he a Democrat or Republican? Well, he's a Democrat. And, and George said, I'm not voting for a Democrat. <laughs> I'm not working for a Democrat. So there's that story, that conspiracy with the and so there's, you know, it seems that they were backing this, and then all of a sudden Hillary just kind of slowed down and didn't do much and let it happen. Well, slowed down. Well, well, I don't know. I mean, and again, I, I have no insight into that. But I will say we know nothing. that the, the Democrats have have not fought for the elections. Uh, Here's, here, I want to tell a story earlier about my friend Mark Crispin Miller. Uh-huh. This is how okay. one becomes a, a conspiracy theorist. So Mark, um, he said he's written for the New York Times, you know, fairly well-known journalist, mainstream journalist, with books. Uh, he still teaches uh, at NYU uh, journalism department. And uh, in 2005, he published a book called Fooled Again. Uh, by a reputable publisher, um, it was about how the election, mach- how the voting machines were hacked, and how the 2004 election was stolen. And so he wrote the book, um, published by a fairly reputable publisher, and um, what happened was shocking to him. 
he was expecting that the left-wing progressive press, um, Mother Jones Magazine, Democracy Now!, all of these would pick up on, on this thing. They ghosted him. They debunked him as a conspiracy theorist. Mainstream media ignored him completely. Now, imagine what happens when in your, you have an actual experience of something. You've, you've studied it. You've gone deep. You put out your truth, and everybody says, what are you going to believe, me or your eyes and ears? And so he actually, he was in a state of shock because he got dismissed and discarded by his fellow progressives and ignored by mainstream media. And so that Mm -hmm. began a journey for him of, uh, first of all, being... um, uh, well, uh, exiled in a certain regard, because what happens is when you come when you come up with something that is um, you know that is not accepted by the by the mainstream, your career is over. Your mainstream career is over. Mm-hmm. A good example of that is what happened to Phil Donahue. Phil Donahue, when he was uh, uh, when he came out against the um, Iraq invasion, he was the most popular. Uh, host on MSNBC, they fired him, just like that. Um, and then when, right. um, oh, what's what's her name? Um, one of the one of the um, talk show hosts uh, started making noises about 9/11. Might have been an inside job. She got fired. They mm-hmm. basically took her out. Yeah. So um, if you have uh, a point of view that does not conform to what uh, those in power want you to want you to believe, you will not be able to get that point of view on the air. Um, and this right. is not only about politics, but it's about medicine. It's about science. Uh, my colleague Bruce Lipton, brilliant uh, biologist, he and I wrote Spontaneous Evolution. He wrote a breakthrough book called Biology of Belief. Um, Can Bruce Lipton ever be on NPR? And the answer is no. No, he will never be on NPR. Because the narrative that he's putting forth that has a lot more to do with quantum medicine than Newtonian medicine, that as you said earlier, that has a lot more to do with um, natural medicine than it does with things that can be patented like drugs, they don't want to hear it. So back to that coming full circle, um, the drug company's agenda, and of course the the media is owned by very few people, and the drug companies is what help fund the media. Ever since um, they've been allowed to advertise on uh, on TV. And so the media does not want to run afoul of that. So there are a number of different alternative narratives. There is only one reality. There is only one reality, and people are working to determine what that reality is. But what makes it more difficult is that people cling to um, half-truths, quarter-truths, and even three-quarter truths that their side is putting forth, and those half-truths are intentionally put in there so that the people on the other side would recognize it as a lie. Let me, let me, I think there's more than one reality. There's a shared reality with all the different tribes. So each tribe yeah, has their yeah. reality that, yeah, so I'm not sure what you mean by there's only one reality. But it seems like what you're, what you're, what you're showing us and what you're, we're talking about here is how all the information is, is, is being controlled by a, um, Overlord narrative of what is acceptable. And if you don't play ball by their rules, you are ousted. You're on the outside. But even if you're on the outside, like I do a show on Revolution Radio, and they all think that they are in the secret know and into conspirituality, right? So they think that they they got the way and the light, and they have they found God, they found Jesus, they found the answers. And so everybody's got their own religion. 
a political. Well, yes, yeah, it is a lot like system. religion. It is. Yeah, yeah, you're right. It is a lot like religion. Now, the one reality, I'm going to say something about the one reality. Um, there mm-hmm. is only one sun. There's only one sun and only one earth. So the sun comes up uh, on November 22nd, um, 1963. Um, only one thing happened. The f- there were not five narratives that happened. Only one of those narratives actually happened. So when I, when I say there's one reality, I'm not talking about what people believe about reality, but really on the only one reality. And that's why I like reading the baseball scores in the morning, because I know mm-hmm. that what happened, what's in the box score is what actually happened. There is a ball game, you know, and, and the guy goes, no, um, that really wasn't a hit. Uh, that was really, uh, that ball was caught. But um, uh, it was erased from the video. That doesn't happen in sports because everybody is there to witness it. Because of the secrecy that we have and because of the secrecy that's perpetuated, nobody is there to witness it. So a lot of these things are based on speculation. They're based on who do you believe? Um, and of course, that's well, that's really what happened what, with November twenty second, nineteen sixty three. Is now we have perspective, uh, and we were debating the reality of that day, which you're saying has only one reality, but none of us know because it's been, you know, been screwed with over and over. With this one happened, that one happened. There's even the theories that that's a different. Uh, what is that called? Um, uh, Mandela effect. No, there was. <laughs> They were uh, two seats. No, they were three seats. So, you know, they have a uh, Conway and his uh, wife were in a second set of seats, you know. And then people say, no, that's the Mandela effect. It was only the, the two seats. So uh, reality gets debated and changed. So, you know, even the past is a function of the now and, and the current spin on the narrative. Well, reality checks are bouncing like crazy right now, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deborah, add your two cents. I know you're wanting to say something. I can feel you. No, no, not not at all, not at all. I, I, I no, you don't honestly have a on. <laughs> <laughs> I know you have opinions I, about all this. Well, I think so much of what's driving what's happening today is the power of social media, right? Um, I don't know if you guys heard, but Facebook. Um, just decided that no new political advertisements will be taking place the week before the election. Um, Everything has to be screened and checked. They're not going to allow what happened last time happen again, where the Russians micro-targeted certain electoral um, um, regions of the country, and that's why... Trump was able to win the electoral vote without the popular vote. Um, So Mm -hmm. they're trying to head the Russians off at the pass. I don't know how good they'll be at that. But, you know, Facebook shouldn't be the only place where people get news. You know, I had a a boss who was a very intelligent man who actually worked for Enron, by the way, who Uh I asked him one time, um, I worked there, um, for Ken Lay and his group, um, the stuff they got caught for, they've been doing that since the company started. It wasn't anything new. And I know that sure. because my boss put those deals together. Um, I was just too young to understand what I was looking at. Um, but, yeah, they just got caught. It took them that long to get caught. They've been doing that since the company started. Anyway, um, I asked them, how do you know what's the truth, right? Um, you know, during those time, all those people lost those shows. You know, NBC was actually owned by GE, who was one of the largest defense contractors in the country. Um, So that's why everything they did had a pro-military plant or a pro-government plant. Um, And he's the one that taught me that. And I asked him, how do you tell what's the truth? And he goes, look at the motivation of the messenger. You know, don't look at the message. Look, don't look at the messenger. Look at the motivation of the messenger. And that will tell you whether you should accept that or not. And then try to validate it through different resources. Don't just stick to one form of news or 
one place for your information and, you know, go to original documentation. You know, I heard all the stories about 9-11, and I've never been a conspiracy theorist. But let me tell you something. After reading the 9-11 report that the government put out, something stinks in there. I'm not sure what it is, but I can tell you it does not smell well. Um, And a lot of facts that I do know about 9-11 tell me what we're being told is not the truth. What is the truth? I'm not sure. But I know what isn't the truth. Um, And so it makes it hard. It makes it easier to make a judgment about whether the information you're getting is real. I don't buy into all that conspiracy theory stuff. Prove it to me. Like I had someone, a friend, preaching to me about the Bible. Well, you know, uh, in um, is it Revelations or something where he goes, it said, let, a, let me make man in my image. And I'm like, no. I go, go back to the original documentation. That's not what it says. It said, let yeah. us make God, let us make Adama in our image. So who is us and what is our, right? And why was that changed? So stuff like that makes me not take anything at face value, but it does make me dig deeper, which I think most people don't do because they're lazy and they just want Facebook or Fox News to be their only form of news. Um, But anyways, you know, I get my news from probably 50 different sources in any given day. And I go, if I want the truth, I dig for facts. I don't just trust a news organization or a social media website because it said so. And I think most people don't do that anymore. And there was a time when the Internet wasn't so accessible that people did spend time trying to get to the truth and find out. So we've just become lazy, and now we're being led around by the nose. And anything that happens to us, we deserve if we don't start questioning why. And I passed the stick. Sorry. I got on a tantrum. Didn't mean to do that. No, no, that was a good That that was a very good. I appreciate what you said. I think one of the key points that you made in, in political science, there's a, there's a principle, there's a Latin phrase, qui bono, who benefits, who benefits. So when you were talking about the messenger, um, what, why is the messenger giving this message? And you can get very cynical about that. You can get very cynical that obviously people are only speaking uh, out of their own uh, self-interest. But I think that the reason why there is so mi- much mistrust of media, and now, now more and more mistrust of the Internet as well, is because media has been managed for so long. And we've, you know, we've gotten used to it, um, and these narratives have been like that for a long time. Um, Mark Crispin Miller, who I just mentioned earlier, um, he, was the, uh, he wrote the forward to... Um, the 2004 uh, edition of Edward Bernays' book, Propaganda. I don't know if you're familiar with Bernays. I recommend that uh, if you want to watch a really interesting uh, documentary, um, it's a BBC documentary from a number of years ago called The Century of of the Self. And Edward Bernays, um, who lived from, um, let's see, he was born in the 1890s. He lived to be... uh, over 100, over 104, I think. Um, but he was Sigmund Freud's nephew. And he was called the father of modern public relations. And he, he cut his teeth during World War I, working on the American campaign uh, against Germany. Um, they had these posters about the Hun, the Hun, you know, dehumanizing the German people uh, during World War I. Um, he worked on a number of other projects. He, he worked for the tobacco companies uh, during the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Um, you know, all of those old commercials that you see where the doctor is saying, I recommend camels or whatever it is. So he, he helped design those. Um, and so Mark, my friend Mark, is, a, is an excellent expert on propaganda. And Bernays was doing his work um, 100 years ago, 80, 90, 100 years ago. They've gotten much more sophisticated since then. And so, so many of the things that we see, uh, you know, for example, at the, um, I think it was about the Oscars or the, um, 
one of the award shows, the Grammys or the Oscars or the one of those award shows a few years ago, yeah. they mm-hmm. had this big, big thing about vaccination. And all of these people came out in favor of vaccination. It became a big, big, big thing. And it was like, wow, why are they doing that? Uh, just as you had mentioned uh, that um, NBC uh, and, and many of the other um, uh, companies that are media companies do things that are uh, to support the military without saying so. Um, if you look at one of the one of the videos I saw that was pointing that was used by QAnon, they had some really very compelling evidence uh, of exactly that thing that the, that the media is giving is a, uh, a, propaganda, a propaganda arm of, of the government uh, and the CIA. And there's a lot of, a lot of um, evidence you know, that the CIA has had people planted in every institution of society since before the Kennedy assassination. Now, when you say stuff like that, it sounds paranoid. It sounds paranoid, but there have been books written about this. There are things that you can find out. And what's happening with Google and with the other social media platforms is that they are changing the algorithms to make sure that uh, stories that debunk those kinds of those kinds of uncomfortable truths come up before you can get to the story. So before you get to see the pandemic movie. Um, you'll get, if you Google Plandemic, P-L-A-N-D-E-M-I-C, you'll learn more from the pieces that come up first debunking it than you will from watching the movie. Because all of those people, all of those postings will tell you who's against it. Are they against it because they're trying to protect the health of the American people? Or are they against it for some other reason, for some other benefit? Um, so your friends at Enron who had that um, check the messenger, um, I think that that's very accurate. And people are very disheartened because the media is not trustworthy. And because the media is trustworthy, is not trustworthy, there's no common, um, there's no common arbiter of the truth. It's not in snow. So what, it's not in Wikipedia. What? What do you what do you think about do you think I think pandemic is just part of the vote for, I think you put it in two parties the Democrats and Republicans so Republicans so pandemic is to get people to back Trump's story and I I don't like Trump because I don't like Trump I don't like how he treats women I don't like how he treats minorities I don't like that's why I don't like him I mean I wouldn't vote for him. He did nothing else. I, I don't like him, right? I want to get some. The pandemic has uh, nothing to do with Donald Trump. Pandemic has nothing to do with Donald Trump whatsoever. He's never, ever, okay, ever, so ever mentioned. Here's, the only problem, the only know, reason why Donald Trump. But it's a strategy. Trump, there's a category. It's, it's not COVID. It, it's COVID, not COVID. It goes into that. Mass, not mass. COVID, not COVID. Um, vaccine, not vaccine. And so the not vaccine is Trump. The not mask is, is uh, Trump, and the uh, COVID is a joke is Trump. So that's why it is Trump. So I dismiss it. I go, I'm not going to watch it. Because there, apparently there's something in, and we talked about this on the show, that uh, there's a video by Ali Belshi or something. It's two clicks and you're down the rabbit hole. There's some kind of programming, like mind control programming, that we've observed people that they're normal people. And they go into this um, this whole QAnon thing, and next thing you know, they're crazy. <laughs> you know, and, and well, I think that that's true. Guided. I think that they've got people who are susceptible to it by taking a mixture of facts and non-facts. They've taken, right. and this is this is how disinformation works. This is how yeah. the the people who started with Edward Bernays. This is how they become so sophisticated at it that you intentionally plant bad information with good information. So let's say mm-hmm. somebody is poking around 
the 9-11 um, story. Uh, my approach is similar to yours. I don't know what happened, but I know what didn't happen, the official story. That didn't happen. Um, and so what happens is, um, let's say, a piece of, a piece of ridiculous uh, information. There were no planes that hit the building. Okay, piece of ridiculous information mm -hmm. gets planted there, and then you get people to believe that. And then all of a sudden, the entire idea that 9-11 was an inside job gets dismissed because there's some ridiculous stuff. Some of the people who believe in this also believe in the flat earth or are Holocaust deniers. Therefore, Why are we not surprised? <laughs> Yeah, anything, anything that is in, in that package. So all you have to do is to, if you want to, let's say you're, you're the CIA or a, an organization like that. Just as um, Lee Harvey Oswald was set up by our government to start his own um, branch of the Fair Play for Cuba Committee so that he could establish himself as a quote-unquote communist even though he was the only member of that committee, and all of the people he hung out with were anti-Castro Cubans, he created a front which allowed a false flag to take place, where um, a perpetration is done, and then you blame it on somebody uh, on the wrong side because it was set up to do that way. False flag. Uh, he was carrying the flag of Castro when really he was representing the flag of the anti-Castro Cubans. So that was 58, 57 years ago. So it's, it's got the way more sophisticated since that time. So let's say um, uh, one of our intelligence organizations says, um, we want to debunk 9-11. So what we'll do is we'll have somebody who's working for us, and all this person is doing is running a Holocaust denial website. That's what they're doing. That's their job. They're paid to run a Holocaust denier website, right? And then that Holocaust denier begins to have articles on his, usually dies, I'll make it a hand, on his website saying that 9-11 was an inside job. So people, so, people, so people who want to debunk that go, look, this guy is a Holocaust denier. He's saying that 9-11 was an inside job. So consequently, the idea that 9-11 was an inside job gets derailed because somebody was a Holocaust tonight. Same thing with this Donald Trump thing. When you go to actually, when you look beyond the Donald Trump is in favor of this, therefore I'm against it, I interviewed uh, on my Wiki Power TV radio show uh, a month ago, uh, Dr. Merrill Mass, he's a very well-known MD, She's an expert on, um, uh, on anthrax, on vaccinations, on, uh, on the uh, Gulf War Syndrome. She was a doctor that identified the Gulf War Syndrome as something that related to the anthrax vaccine that was given to soldiers at that time. Um, and so she is actual practicing MD in the and she's been using uh, hydro, uh, hydroxychloroquine with her patients in a certain very specific protocol. And but because Donald Trump what came out in favor of it, obviously it's got to be wrong. When you go deeper, as you had suggested, you find out that there's certain things that are intentionally associated with Donald Trump so that people will not look at the facts. Donald Trump is in favor of it, I won't look at the fact. A Democrat is in favor of it, I won't look at the fact. And that is how people are manipulated by the silos and the narratives that they're subject to. You know, you probably know that Google, a couple of years ago, it was uncovered that Google feeds you information that supports what you already believe. And that's how these, these um, narratives and silos are perpetuated so that the barriers between people are uh, are up. 
on the positive side, I'm very happy to announce that I'm part of a new media platform called Mobilized, and our focus is to be the independent media. Our focus is to have uh, articles from all across the political spectrum um, that point, point us toward the truth. Um, the guy who's running it, he's very, uh, very much anti-Donald Trump. You know, he does not want Trump to be reelected. At the same time, he recognizes that one of the reasons why Trump is in there is because of the fundamental mistrust of the media and that people who want to think independently have no place to go to have their narrative heard. You can go to MSNBC, you can go to Fox News, but those narratives, and you can go to CNN, but if you go to what is a, what's considered a quote-unquote middle of the road, there, there's a lot that they can't talk about. They can't talk about alternative COVID views. They can't talk about 9-11. They can't talk about the Kennedy assassination. They can't talk about um, the military-industrial complex, really. They can't talk about why it is that people are getting sick. They can talk about whether there should be universal health coverage. But um, when Marianne Williamson tried to bring this up uh, at the debates last summer, why are people getting sick? Is it possible that the same industries that run the philanthropies that are funding the cures for cancer and heart disease and never find the cures, but really are, um, are in the business of symptom management of these chronic diseases, is it possible that the very things that we're doing on the front end are causing the problems on the back end? Nobody wants to have that conversation. Nobody wants to have the conversation about how we're really poisoning the air, the water, and the food. Nobody wants to have the conversation about Monsanto. The mainstream Democrats don't want to have that well, conversation. Well, they do here. They do here in, in Maui. They demonstrate. And they, they Well, every time you win anything, then they over I'm not talking, over about, I'm not so talking we, about the Democrat. I'm not talking about the Democrat rank and file. I'm not talking about those people. Uh, I'm talking about the Democratic politicians. I'm talking about Joe Biden, who just had a meeting. Well, they're in the fact, club. Now, anybody that gets into the millionaire club, they can't talk about it because they're eating babies and they're, they're having sex with children. And we covered that to begin with. So, no, you're not going to get anybody who's got more than $50 million in the bank uh, shooting themselves in the foot because it's always about money. It's, always about, it's a cash class system we have here. We really don't have... Um, blue and red. We have the rich class, and then the rest of them. And I'm not there's in. There's an it. Organ, there's an organization, uh, an organization I support called Represent.us. Uh, they have a, unrigged the system. They have a conference every year, and they are working. This is it's a transpartisan group um, of a lot of young people who are working to end corruption by changing the voting system by ending gerrymandering, by creating ranked choice voting, which means that, um, let's say, in the, in the primaries, um, I had three choices. Uh, let's say my first choice was Marianne Williamson. My second choice was um, Bernie Sanders. And my third choice was Elizabeth Warren, let's say. I could confidently vote for my first choice. And if that candidate didn't win, then it would go to the second choice and then the third choice. There are cities that have adopted this. There are ways to get money out of politics. Uh, there's, a, uh, there's the Move to Amend movement, which would uh, change, uh, overturn Citizens United through a constitutional amendment. So there are organizations that are outside the political mainstream that are looking to reform politics from the outside so that when we actually vote for a candidate, the candidate is going to care about what we think more than they're going to care about who's paying them. When you take the power of money out of politics. The system is broken. If you look at course. the extraterrestrial point, we're, we're extraterrestrials. We're looking down on primitive, barbaric planet Earth. Huh. And none of this 
lot of the systems are working because they don't meet the basic needs of the citizens of the planet. I mean, the basic exactly. needs society. Yeah, our needs need to be that. How, how dare we give birth to people, you know, forget about abortion and, you know, killing people after they're alive. We're, you know, we're bringing these souls into earth and we don't have the basic systems in place to support them so they can grow up and, and support themselves. But that's even a shame-blame system. Oh, you're lazy. You're stupid. You know, everything's about... Shaming is a bully system. That's why I don't like Trump. It's a bully. It's part of the bully system. Shaming people. There's no encouragement. You know, but you know everybody's what? life is valuable. The same, the same shaming that's going on around the net. You have people um, yelling at each other, you know, shouting obscenities at each other, either masked or unmasked, one side against the other. Um, and... Uh, you know, it's, this is something that it is a fundamental problem with humanity at this point is that we are so focused on what we don't want that we, um, we don't really know how to actually talk about what we do want. And that part of what we're doing so what is you, what would you do, Steve? What would you do, Steve, if you are black and you've had 400 years of slavery in your family going back as far as you can see and and your your kids walking down the street riding a bike and the, and the cop shoots them in the back because something uh, they have a sticker on his bike or whatever and and so what would you do i mean i'm trying to understand everybody locking everybody's shoes for a day right locking a trump shoe my brother's a trumpet and locking his shoes and and then and I just go back to, you know, I'm, I'm a hippie, but I go back to the 60s. I was born Republican, raised Republican, and I'm in the 60s. So what is going on here? Doesn't anybody see the hypocrisy of it all? And I was back in the 60s. So here I am many, many years, 50 years later, and I'm going, this is not kind or loving. That's my basic litmus. Is that kind? Is that loving? Is that supporting your fellow human beings? Does, does that uplift us? No. So I vote against it. I vote with my voice, I vote with my vote, I vote against it. Pretty basic. And so, yes, we need to overturn the entire system because none of the communism, socialism, democracy are working. They're not meeting the needs of the population. They're not encouraging us to do and become our best. We have geniuses living in the the, the ghettos, and we're not looking for the the people that can uplevel our civilization and, and cure diseases and, and have the, the green energy systems. And when we come up with it, which many of my whistleblowers have, we already have the M drive, we already have space travel, we already have time travel, we already have the cures for all diseases. I have people that have been on board ship and they, they have very compelling stories and they say they, they took their guy's head off and they put it back on. And we have people that are in the secret space program. I, I went to Mars and, and I got killed and I can wake up in the regen machine and there's no death because I'm too valuable as a super soldier. So they sent me back in the front. So there's all these stories out there. But, and it's all well, you know, is, How do we operationalize it and make it happen when the Illuminati power elite control everything and down to, you know, by controlling us, so we act out in these hideous ways, and, you know, then they can send in troops, which is what they're doing. Well, the only, We're done. the one thing that we have, the one thing that we have uh, is our human heart. The one thing that we have is the love that we are. That's what we have. That's our, that's our asset. Mm-hmm. And in reaching, in reaching out to other people and connecting with other people, all we can do all we can do is be the love that we are. All we can do is that. All we can do is make the choice to be kind or not kind. Um, in terms of the political situation right now, um, I, I'm talking about a two-step program. Step one, de-elect the misleader. Get that energy. You know, it's a... It's a um, um, a malignancy. So first you've got to excise the malignancy. But once you do that, then you have to address the disease on the field. And the disease on the field 
has to do, if, it, if you have to go to one fundamental issue, it's the illusion of separation. It's the illusion of separation. It's, re, it's the idea that we're in a world where it's either you or me. And we've lived in this world of dominate or be dominated since the advent of, uh, of Western civilization, since the matriarchal societies, which were not women dominated, but egalitarian, uh, since we've, um, those societies were overrun by marauding hordes, we all have in our DNA, we live in a world that is dominate or be dominated. So if, you're, if, you're, if fear is being programmed into you, the more fearful you become, the more you buy into the dominate or be dominated program. And so naturally, you want to elect the president who's going to be a better dominator. So for those people who have been mobilized by fear, whether they've been hypnotized by uh, QAnon or whether they've been hypnotized by evangelical Christianity, or whether they've been hypnotized by uh, these other toxic forces that are designed to mess with our minds, whether it's coming from another country or from this, from this country, the more fear is imbued into the body politic, the less intelligent the decisions are going to be made. Same is happening on the left. Um, if you look at the Democrats, if you look at their choices, they've, they've taken the least courageous path. They've taken the path of safety. We'll elect the candidate that we imagine is safe, that's going to appeal to um, non-Trump Republicans. He's going to have a big tent. And I'm thinking, hmm, what could possibly go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is that it's exactly, that is exactly wrong for the times. The times require courage. The times require vision. The times require somebody saying we're all in this together and let's build that together, not in some cliched, lame-ass Democrat way, but in something that really brings people together and says we will address the issues of uh, big pharma running everything. We will address that. And so as long as the Democrats are So who would you vote for, Steve? If you could just go to the – and vote for her, what would be – our heart's desire was instead of this two-party system. I'll tell you exactly who I'm – I'll tell you exactly who I'm voting for. I'm voting for for Joe Biden. However, Mm -hmm. I'm saying – it's important that we don't get behind Joe Biden, but that we get ahead of Joe Biden. And I'm yeah. recommending a two-step, two-step program. Step number one, de-elect the misleader. Step number two, bring Americans from across the political spectrum into a conversation about purpose and about what we have in common that is not mediated by the media, not mediated by corporations, not mediated by the government, not mediated by the political parties. Uh, so the two projects I'm working on right now that I'm most excited about, uh, one is this mobilized.news, where we are creating a conversation for all people, and then a project called um, National Town Square, which would provide an advisory virtual vote for everybody um, you can just use your personal device. Um, it's as verifiable as your bank code. So in other words, it's only real people. No bots, no trolls, only real people can vote on any issue, any issue. And so what happens when 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 million people begin to register their opinion, their vote on a particular issue, then we have an advisory branch of government that doesn't exist right now. And it'll become apparent that, wow, um, 90% of Americans want this. Well, why don't we have it? But that, well, that's, 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 it. that's another whole thing about voting. Highline said we have, you know, 51% of the population can tell that, you know, the other 49%. I mean, even, even the whole thing of out voting other people is not addressing 
the rights of everyone. It has to be even different than voting because you can have everybody vote for an idiot for president. Oh, duh, that's what happened, right? So <laughs> it's, voting's not it. It has to be a duffer, and it can't be just one, you know, um, dictator dictating. There's got to be another system of, of representation of, of uh, you know, um, a society than what we currently have, and I don't think we're, we've come up with it. The only thing that I think would be is that every uh, kind of category needs to be represented by their population amount. I, I got a download one time, and, it, and it basically it was like every 100 people needs to have a representative, or every, every 10 people. You keep voting, you know, by 10s until everybody gets some kind of representation, and everybody's thought, maybe just pure democracy. Everybody gets to vote. But, you know, we need to have intelligent people. And so the entire population needs to be educated. We all need education, not this um, programming. We're getting programming. We're, we're exactly. In a that's, part, program. that's, that's a, that's a getting problem. Programming. The problem is the stupidization program that's been going on. Um, and that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the stupidization program. It's, stupid, it's called stupidization. Right. Um, that makes people stupid. Stupidization. And, and yet, uh, in my experience, um, when you bring people together um, and you create a, a, a context where people can listen to one another, um, everything changes. People begin to respect each other's point of view. Whether or not the, their own point of view changes, they're able to rehumanize. I interviewed... Um, uh, Wiki Politiki two weeks ago, um, uh, Bill Doherty, who is one of the founders of an organization called Braver Angels. And these people have been, since the election of 2016, uh, they've been bringing together people from across the political spectrum in a very specific engagement process where um, they get to listen respectfully to one another and then afterward, what's really surprising is people begin to understand how another person can have a point of view. They begin to hear that point of view, and people begin to modify, well, you know, that could make sense. That could make sense. I could see that. Because, you know, I, I consider myself a progressive, but there's a lot of stuff mm -hmm. that progressives buy that I don't buy. I'm, I'm, a, um, I'm not a big fan of identity politics, political correctness. I think it's, I think it's, um, uh, it's designed to keep us divided. Um, I think the mm -hmm. Democratic Party has done a huge disservice through identity politics um, and, uh, and this whole cancel culture baloney. Uh, it's very totalitarian. It's a lot like uh, the... Um, uh, Chinese Cultural Revolution was. So I don't buy um, the whole package, and a lot of conservatives don't buy the whole package. But what happens is when you're forced to um, vote for that side, like we are every two years or every four years, without having any other input into policy, um, then right. So we need to we need to understand. I think what you're saying is, uh, we need to put everybody's needs on the table. So when you're when you're talking to a Trump person, what are their needs? What needs aren't getting met? And so and look at their fears. What are they fearful of? Well, part of it, this um, agenda is to preserve oh, America, and their their concept of America is, is a white you know, white America. And and so they're not uh, in, uh, inputting the needs of the, the brown and black people. Or they or they like being, uh, they think they need to feel superior to somebody else. But that's not a need. So if we can get down to the needs. That's why I like the, uh, the concept of the basic minimum needs economy. So what if we had, um, you know, these free energy systems, if the government finally let out the cures for the diseases in the free energy system, with free energy, we would meet the needs of everybody. You never had to pay for gas ever again. You never had to, you know, these things would not be polluting, not destroying our environment. It'd be clean, green systems. 
and and then um, you know that's a whole kind of Star Trekian society that everything shifts automatically. Everybody's needs. Well, it. exactly right. That's but we're the not whole getting point. the needs. That's- when you actually get people into conversations and expose them to these things that are possible, that are already happening, um, I think uh, uh, you're probably familiar with the Thrive Movement, uh, Foster and Kimberly Gamble. They put out the first Thrive movie. There's another Thrive movie coming out um, in the near future. Uh, And this is really, a. they've spent the last uh, eight or ten years looking at alternative healing systems, alternative energy systems. They've been vetting a lot of these ideas. A lot of them are are bogus, but some of them work. And so in bringing, um, as you said, imagine what would happen if there was free energy. But we have the systems that we have in place now where um, our, our entire economy is based on scarcity and on perpetuating scarcity. And so that's because uh, we wanna... that, that provides the slaves and the money to keep the top of the pyramid going. But we need to stop being on a pyramid scheme. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we need to find money <laughs> equally across the board. So that's that's an enlightened point of view. And I think that if we want to quote unquote keep your eye on the price, that's the price. The price is not so much where we disagree about, but what do we all have in common? What do we all want? So my, it's kind of a jokey way of saying, but I have what I'm calling the great upwising. When we wake up, wise up, grow up, and show up. We wake up to the illusion of separation, always been divided and conquered. We wise up to the power of love. We wise up to the power of coherence, of focusing on a common good, common wealth, common interest. We grow up to, from children of God to adults of good, we become sovereign soul, S-O-U-L, proprietors of our own destiny. Um, and we become conscious and wise actors with an individual connection to source, whatever we call it, whether we call it God, great spirit, the cosmos, the unspeakable, the inexplainable, the ineffable, whatever that is, That is that one love. We have our own connection to it, so we don't have to get it from out there. We're not hungry ghosts getting it from out there. And then we show up on a new playing field ready to play a new game. Instead of identity politics, we focus on the identical issues that we all have. Clean air, clean water, clean food, clean government, and creating a world where our children can have... Instead of being in um, competition uh, in the old form, are competing in the Greek sense of competition, which is striving together to do their personal best for the betterment of each and all. I love and it. That's, I love it. That's the I. That's where we're going. So the the Bible says, "Where there's no vision, the people perish." Where there is a vision, I say the people thrive. So part of mobilized and the great upwising is to give people a way to begin to weave these constructive ideas together so that these old narratives of fighting one another reveal themselves for the scam that they are. And we don't have to choose between Donald Trump and Joe Biden. This is the transitional time. My hope and prayer is that... Um, we de-elect Joe Biden, we de-elect Donald Trump, and Joe Biden is kind of the um, the placeholder during this four-year period of time where awakening conservatives and progressives, the populists and the progressives, come together for the first time in 100 years since the farm labor movement 100 years ago and begin to recognize that the one common enemy is the very, very small percentage of oligarchs, whatever you want to call them. You don't have to call it a conspiracy. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, a, it's blatant. It's happening out there. You, you know, you don't have to say it's a conspiracy. It's true. So what is it? the need of uh, the rich? What is going on with the need of the super rich that they, they, they feel they need to 
be better than everybody else and have more. It's greed. What is greed? It's a mental illness. Hoarding is a mental order, uh, illness. They're they're hoarding. But, but, you know, and, and if they were to just put you know one two three percent back into the population, everybody would have all their needs. But we'd have food, clothes, housing, housing education. We'd have a very high civilization if we started to really educate you everybody. Know, so a misconception. A misconception. What's that? Greed. A, a misconception. I call. I call what we have the old needy, needy, greedy. N e d y g r e d d e y. Needy, greedy. That greed uh-huh. pervades humanity from from the poorest to the richest, and that we are all taught scarcity. And whether we're on the mm-hmm. low end of the totem pole uh, and have very little, or on the high end where we have too much, it's the same disease. Uh, Lynn Twist, um, who um, is written and uh, who has been working with people for almost 50 years, um, working with with wealthy people to help them redirect their their money to help them turn their guilt and shame and defensiveness into ways of using their money to have great impact in the world. Yeah, but that, so there are a lot that of people feeds their, their egos when you go into this, um, that they, they get to hoard their wealth and they get to decide, you know, where they're going to give it to charity. That's just nothing more than creating these monsters. They just need to pay their – if they would just pay their fair share of taxes across the board, we as a society, a global society, would have more than enough money for everyone. But that's been the strategy since um, – uh, what's his name? Um, you know, trickle-down guy, um, Reagan, to just keep feeding the top because, and trusting the top is going to be generous and – but no, that's just feeding their egos. We've had 40 years of that. It doesn't work. Well, well yeah, I think that I think that the philanthropy industrial complex is one of is is a uh, kind of a um, an unsung, unidentified evil that you have an entire you know if you look at the Gates Foundation and all of these things, they're making a lot of money. You become a lot wealthier through the Gates Foundation because of what nonprofits can do. And there are quite a few people who you would consider in the one percent and the top you know, top, top, top percent who say, Yes, we should pay more taxes. Yes, we volunteer we should pay more taxes. We should change the laws. And well, why don't they just people- give it to the, the the give it back? <laughs> Have a system where they can give it back to a common pool which will meet the basic needs of every human being alive. No one needs you know, to starve and, and be homeless. That's step one. It's happening. There is a, a, I interviewed a guy, I'm not remember his name right now, but he um, was used to work in the collections industry. And he and a few other people who got tired of collecting money from people who had maxed out their health care and were going bankrupt, created a fund to buy medical debt at 10 cents on the dollar. And they liberated a lot of people from medical debt through people putting their money into this 10 cents on the dollar, buying medical debt and liberating people from um, forever in the poorhouse. Now, it's actually the system that has to change. It's a fundamental system. And uh, here, here's a, um, the uh, Financial Freedom Act. Um, Scott Smith, another guy I would do. By the way, if you go to Wiki Politiki, W-I-K-I-P-O-L-I-T-I-K-I. Wait, you, you're getting a little bit muffled. Can you speak into the mic a little bit? Sure, you're starting to do it If you go to, you go to Wiki, Wiki Politiki, W I K I. P O L I T I K I WikiPolitiki dot com. I've interviewed lots and lots of solutionaries, and one of them is named Scott Smith, and he has been in the financial industry since the '80s. He was one of the people who um, uh, helped create, um, restore the financial system after the um, uh, um, uh, uh, housing scandal. 
uh, in in the 80s, um, and then he he was uh, worked for Nelson Mandela to help them create their money system. He's created something mm-hmm. called the Financial Freedom Act, uh, where he figures that instead of an income tax, we would tax um, speculative transactions. You know, there's trillions of dollars that get exchanged electronically every day, and if we uh, right. tax the just like a very, very, very tiny percentage, we could raise five times the money that we are raising through taxes right now. We could eliminate the income tax completely. We could allow uh, free health care for everybody. Uh, We could pay off our national debt, and we can provide a guaranteed income of $24,000 for every American. That would eliminate the welfare system, which is a (laughs) <laughs> it's a disincentive system. Yeah. So basically, imagine imagine you're getting twenty four thousand dollars a year, and you can earn as much as you want. You don't have to. You're not penalized if you take a job. And so what happens is everybody it it, it brings out the best in capitalism. It brings out the best in socialism. It ends the argument between capitalism and socialism. Everybody's taking right. care of. Socialism. Anybody can make as much as they want. That's why I was going to vote for um, Andrew Yang, who had part of it. So, so these systems are out there. So, what we need to do is educate. Put those out on the website. Here's the system, and have a vote for it. Because if it would meet all the needs of the society, then why not do it? You know, there's so then you're looking at people. uh, Okay, they're not going to work. That's your argument. Well, they won't work. No, people are going to work for luxuries. Their needs are going to be met, but they're going to want to. They're not going to all want to have, you know, like a, a flip phone. They're going to want to have an iPhone, right? They're going to want to have a big screen TV. They're going to want to have a, a you know, a nicer house. And you can basically meet. Right now, we've got all these abandoned buildings. What are we going to do with all these malls? You could turn those into <laughs> apartment complexes. It's really easy. And these people know, they're, they're this problem here fun. in Maui. Huh? You know, you know what's, what's really funny, I mean, it's that it, there's a joke here, and I'm sorry that I haven't been so funny today, but this has been an important conversation. No, I guess fine. We, we had to, yeah, it's vex, I love it. It's vexing everybody. Uh, but the joke is, um, uh, I, uh, I, I go, I know what you're thinking. I'm proposing a sane world. I must be crazy. Um, everything <laughs> is insane. Everything is insane. And so what we have to recognize is that sanity, the name of we have to go sane together. We have to bring people um, away from these divisive narratives. I know we have an election coming up. I know how I'm going to vote. I know where my wishes and prayers are going to be. That we um, that we take out the cancer that we that is in the body politic. However, no. in order for the next thing that we have to do is we have to bring the people of this country together to educate one another, self-educate. Um, Joseph McCormick, one of my great teachers, um, the trans, uh, conservative, Republican, uh, transpartisan activist um, who ran for Congress in, uh, as a Republican in Florida, lost the election, went through a dark night of the soul, wound up in a cabin in um, Floyd, Virginia, he was adopted by a band of hippies, and uh-huh. uh, he had, you know, father told him, you know, pointing to the demonstrators, his father told him, those people hate America. Well, he found out that they didn't hate America. He had an epiphany. I think he had an epiphany, if you know what I mean. Maybe he had an epiphany. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, he an epiphany. Yeah. His, <laughs> you know, his mission was to reunite America. And uh, he brought together, this mm-hmm. is in the mid-2000s, brought together leaders, Sierra Club, Christian Coalition, MoveOn.org, Grover Norquist, all of this. And in this retreat, um, Joan Blades from MoveOn, um, Michelle Combs from Christian Coalition, they became friends. They became friends. And um, mm-hmm. they ended up taking out a full-page ad in the New York Times, Move On. Christian Coalition, to protect net neutrality, they shut down the switchboards of Congress. That's how powerful that movement was, working across party lines, 
for the interests that we all have in common. You put what we don't have in common in the background, you put what we do have in common in the foreground, instead of a tug of war, you have a tug of peace. You know, um, three years ago, Yay, those people, feet. remember when the, the swimmers off the coast of Florida were stranded in the riptide and the, the people on the beach made a human chain to reach them and pull them to safety? Remember that? Yeah. Uh-huh. When that happened, yeah. Uh, I guarantee that people didn't turn to each other helping pull, going, hey, are you a Democrat or a Republican? They were all pulling together right. for the common uh, and they temporarily were uh, pulled away from the trance of separation, the illusion of separation. They were working on something together, knowing that there are systems of health where we can restore the soil instead of destroying it, knowing that there are systems of health where we use energy medicine, like the uh, rice machines that were outlawed, thanks to the American Medical Association, knowing that there are alternatives to, uh, to vaccines and that kind of medicine and that emergency high-intervention medicine mm-hmm. is safe for those cases when they're absolutely necessary, knowing that there are ways for us to um, have free energy, um, abundant energy, instead of fighting one another, this is heaven on earth. And um, again, right, if so we're how not, how do we do this, Steve? We're running out of time. These are one. I think, I, think, I, I think, can I can back you 100 percent with all this, but we need to somehow actualize well, it. Well, follow my motion. follow so my great uprising. Uh, go to Wiki Politiki. Um, I will send you a link for Mobilize. That's going to be the gathering okay, send place me all for the people links. who want. Yeah, all the links. Because I, I really and, have a sense of urgency. Maybe it's because I'll die soon. Maybe, but I love this earth, and I'm here to make this happen. Now we're getting all the concepts, and we somehow have to actualize it. And we're, we're at a critical mass time, and and so um, yeah, everything's been politicized. So anyway, we'll continue the dialogue. I want to. I want to. Share. I want to just, um, yeah, let me just have uh, Deborah. Do you have the final word to say? Because we're running out of time, and then. We'll go. I'll give you the final word, Steve. Go ahead, Deborah. Okay. What he said, like, I agree with everything he's talking about. Um, yes. And I love I love how he calls it a situation. <laughs> situation. Yeah. We're in a major situation. Yes. And that's it. And that's it. And, okay. Uh, so Steve, uh, We're in a situation, and the way out the way out is for us to make bridges to people that we uh, we don't think we like. Um, there's a great movie to watch, uh, watch um, Accidental um, Courtesy. It's about a black musician who, over a period of 30 years, befriended members of the Ku Klux Klan, and uh, he had oh, I saw that. 30 or 40 robes hanging in his closet of people who gave up the Klan because he was able to hear them. Right, and and I guess they want to be listened to. That's part of uh, active listening. It's like people it's, want to be heard, uh, empathized with, understood. That's why we get down to the needs. And then we can, if we meet the needs of the planet, and then we can meet the needs of the whole planet and have a planet to live on. Okay, uh, your website one more time, and then the, we're going to be out of time. Wiki, your Wiki, Wiki, W-I-K-I, Wikipolitiki, W-I-K-I-P-O-L-I-T-I-K-I, or com. That's the funny website. And um, just keep in mind, uh, in the short run, register as many voters as you can. That is our immune system for the body politic, to get rid of the sociopathogen that we're facing right now. Once we do that, then we can begin to build our health. I agree. Cool. Well, thank you, Steve. Uh, I'll, I'll talk you off the air. I'd like you to come on one of my other shows with Dr. Sure. Nelson. He would love to uh, talk to you about those stuff. I want to thank all the listeners for coming today. It was a great show. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you, those that are going to listen to this. Um, yeah, we'll have you give us our feedback. 
We'll do, we'll be joining you again tomorrow on the Aquarian Radio Network. And thank you very much. Love and blessings. And aloha. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.